Welcome to Jazz Zone Together, our new online jazz community where we will provide jazz education and classroom resources, interviews with jazz educators, artists, and celebrities, along with valuable teaching tips and repertoire suggestions. Today, we're pleased to welcome renowned jazz educator and co-founder of the Jazz Education Network, Lou Fisher. Lou recently retired from his position as coordinator of jazz activities at Capital University in Ohio. Now I'll turn the mic over to Dick Dunscombe to conduct the interview with Lou. Dick, take it away. Thank you, Bob. Well, today is a very special day for all of us in the jazz education field. Lou Fisher, welcome, Lou. Well, thank you, Dick and Bob. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm humbled and honored to be asked. Well, you are one of the most active and most important educators in our field for the last many years. So what we want to do is we want to find out a little bit about you. Um, let's begin with where you grew up and what influenced your desire to pursue a music career? Well, first, uh, I grew up in S South San Antonio, Texas. Um, and I'll just have to say that, that, that I don't think I ever consciously chose music as a career. It chose me, like it does most people, right? And oh, at three years old, my parents told me that we were watching our black and white TV back then, and Elvis was on Ed Sullivan, and I was imitating him and, and picking up my dad's big guitar, big old K guitar, box guitar, pretending I was Elvis. And then, of course, the Beatles hit, and man, I heard music I had never heard before because everything where I grew up was Tejano music or R&B, and that's what I grew up playing. But I was always sitting on the porch with a bunch of tin cans and boxes trying to be a drummer, playing along with the radio. And I guess somebody heard something. And um, my brother had a, a rock band called the Whirly Birds. And they asked me to play along with them on something. And, and it wasn't drums. They asked me, uh, they asked me to play guitar because my dad had taught us all the four different chords, you know, G, C, A, and D. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was always one for melody, though. I like the melody. So I learned the melodies to three tunes at that point. So at eight years old, I'm playing once every other weekend with my brother's band on the radio in Pleasanton, Texas. We drive down to Pleasanton and get on the radio. Play a tune and they feature me on either In the Moon, North to Alaska, or Honky Tonk. <laughs> First three tunes I ever knew. And then, like I said, I was playing these makeshift drums. I really wanted to be a drummer, I think. And then the Beatles hit and you know, I just fell in love with their music and then, these guys were coming around rehearsing with my brother and they said, hey, we, we'd like to have you play some drums with our band. My mother said, well, if you'll pick him up, take him to the job and make sure he gets home and he behaves himself, you can, you can do that. So I had a six night a week gig at the U.S. Army base in Fort Sam Houston at the officer's mess with this Tejano R&B band playing drum set. And then our bass player quit about six months into it. I think we made $13 a night or something like that. But our bass player quit, and it was a pretty new instrument then because we're talking 64. And, um, you know, electric bass came on the market around 59. And so I said, well, you know, I played a little guitar with my family around the house, and uh, which I have to tell you about that too. And, and uh so I said, I'll switch to bass. And I got a friend that can play the drum set. And uh, when we get a bass player, I'll move back over. Well, I never moved back over. I've been a bass player ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of years later. Yeah. But my dad used to, I would say he would, he's a wannabe singer, guitar player, fiddle player, harmonica player. I was. And, and he used to have us sit around every night before a lot of TV. And we'd sit around and either listen to the radio or we'd sit around and sing and play guitars. 
and he taught us all those four chords and I'm not able to sing harmony and and I learned so many classic country tunes you wouldn't believe and for a lot of years I really disliked country music for that reason but I've come to learn over time that that it really had a lot to do with shaping my musical aptitude and and my interest you know so uh, backgrounds not in jazz at all and until I went to a school at North Texas later. Yeah. All right. Well, that's cool. I, I like that story a lot. So you mentioned North Texas, and I know that you were there for a period of time and a member of the Warner Clock. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that educational uh, element, not only there, but at the University of Denver and again at Ball State. Okay. Um, in 1970, I graduated high school, and, and of course, this was right during Vietnam. And so, you either were in school, or you're on some kind of medical deferment, or you went to, to war. Well, I was fortunate to always know I wanted to teach, but I just didn't know what I wanted to teach. And I was a tuba player in high school. Started out in euphonium and then moved to tuba. Well, so I go to North Texas on a tuba scholarship. I think it was $50. And a hundred and fifty dollar uh, PTA scholarship, and some state grant money because we didn't. My family didn't have the money to send me to school, and I'm the first person in my family to go to school. And so, I go to North Texas, and the third day, I'm walking down the hall and I hear this music. I go, "What in the world is that?" And it was the auditions for the for the lab band program. And I walked in the room and I sat down and getting chills talking about it. I sat down and I listened for seven hours straight to all of these people in and out of these audition chairs. And these bands were amazing and the music was just amazing to me. So I went up to uh, Jim Hall, the drummer, um, and he was handling the auditions, and I said, I'd like to audition. I play a little bit of electric bass. And he goes, well, sign up. There's a sheet outside. So I signed up for the next day, and I, I couldn't read music on electric bass at all. I didn't play acoustic bass yet, and, but, I, but I did read as a tuba player. And so I came back the next day to audition, and they, I'll never forget the first chart they put in front of me was blues and, and the abstract truth. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was a blues, but because I kind of went all the way around that one. Um, but I looked at the chart and it had chords and slashes, and I, I looked over at Jim Hall and I said, What do the slashes mean? <laughs> I just had no clue. He goes, Just play some on every beat, and you'll be fine. And I auditioned and I made the six o'clock lab band. And within a year, um, I worked pretty hard and did a lot of studying and, and just fell in love with this music. Been there ever since. Made the one o'clock the next year. Um, hung the two above right away. <laughs> and and I, first of all, you look at the orchestra. You go eight bases, one two above. More work. So I just moved over there, started taking acoustic bass, and uh, the rest is kind of history. And apparently, somebody uh, that was visiting us there, his name was John Monahan, great bass player from from the '60s in that band. Back when Soph was there the first time. Uh, I was fortunate always to be in the band with people over 30. Everybody was back in school at that time, uh, trying to stay out of the war, I guess. I don't know what, why, but, but uh, and some people like Frank Manti and, and Jim and those guys were on uh, military uh, uh, support. You know? So I was always fortunate to be in that band. There were only two of us under 30, and we were both 19 years old. So we were being mentored daily mentored day. And I've always been really lucky to be around people like that, that took you under their wing and, and told you when you weren't doing something right. And, and then, then, then complimented you when you work, you know, and, and helped you get better at what, what we did. So, you know, Breeden was just a gym, you know, and he knew, he knew just to kind of stand, you know, let the band talk. And uh, all those guys, when we go on tour, they take me to the back of the bus and twist my ear, my arm, and you need to listen to this guy, you, you, Ron Carter, you need to listen to Rufus Reed, you need to listen to this. So, 
Um, that just changed my life forever. I'll never forget that. And then later, I decided to go back to school because I was fortunate enough, because of the one o'clock band, um, you know, to, to move on into a pretty good career as a performer. Uh, and later on, after I had two children, uh, after him, we were born, and I just wanted to just spend some time there. So I decided, I don't want to be doing this the rest of my life. I want to teach. I always knew I wanted to do that. And um, I just kind of ordered some people to go back to school and finish, you know. So I went to University of Denver, where I was teaching part-time, and um, found out I could get a tuition waiver. So I went into school, and I had the dubious honor of being an undergrad student, a part-time instructor, uh, and then working on a master's at the same time. They allowed me to do that, and then hired me as the grad assistant. So I had four titles all at the same time. So I spent three years there and got both degrees done because I did not finish at North Texas. I left like most people and so because I was working all the time. And then uh, matriculated straight from that. And this is later in life now. I went back to 41. So I uh, went straight from there to Ball State and was a doctor assistant there which carried with it the title of uh, Assistant Director Jess that is under, under Larry McWilliams. And um, that was intriguing to me because I've always enjoyed administration. Uh, had a lot of other side careers in my life, music publishing for 13 years. I did uh, a nightclub for two because um, when I was out on the road, you know, just sucked my money away. I didn't spend much. Um, pretty practical that way. And, uh, Bought my first house when I was 18, you know, and uh, just did, I was always frugal that way and, and managed to claw myself out of uh, the humble beginnings, so to speak, and education's a big contributor to that. The Ball State was great, great fun. It was two years. Oh, I should mention this too. The second year I was there, uh, my boss came down with a illness and had to take a semester off. So suddenly I was interim director of jazz studies as a student. So that was some throw, throw your feet in the fire and see how you do training. And uh, then I just went straight from there to my job at Capital. And after 26 years, retired this past April. And I guess I picked a pretty good year to retire. <laughs> yes, I agree. Well, that's a, that's a great journey, Lou. And uh, of course, Larry McWilliams is one of the legendary people in our field. And to, to have matriculated through all of those different stages, it's incredible. Your uh, professional playing career also had you touring and playing with artists in a variety of, of settings throughout the years. Can you talk to us a little bit about that side of your career? Oh, sure. It's, it's, it's pretty... Uh stylistically diverse. As I said, I grew up playing Tejano R&B. Learned about jazz in North Texas uh, and, and started playing around town. And Nick, lo and behold, I get a call from the great Don Jacoby, one of the first ever clinicians in our field. And he uh, was putting a band together to work six nights a week at a club called the Keynote. He wanted me to join it. And I said, man, yeah, I'd be on. So I joined Don Jacoby. That was the first experience with a small big band, little big band, if you will. Um, three horns and rhythm section and a couple singers. And it was just a, a great time for, well, we did that almost two years, I guess. And then um, I remember the great drummer, Steve Houghton, had come, come to North Texas by then. And uh, he subbed on our band one night. And we just hit him off great. And he's probably my oldest and dearest friend. He and, uh, he and Pat Coyle are the same vintage as me. We've known each other a long time. And we were playing, and um, man, and Steve said, I wish we could do this some more. And I said, well, let's do it some more. He goes, well, I'm leaving town. I'm joining Woody Herman's band. And I said, well, someday we'll get a chance. Well, about three weeks later, I get a call from Steve Houghton. He says, uh, our bass player is leaving would you be interested in the gig? I said, well, like most young players, right away out of your mouth is, how much does it pay? 
Because <laughs> I was involved in, in studio work pretty heavy then in the Dallas Summer Musicals, and I was producing events. And, uh, I kind of did that as a sidebar. And, you know, I was a little reluctant to give some of that money up. And he says, well, if you've got to ask what it pays, you don't want to do it. I said, well, let me think about it. Give me about three days and let me think it through and talk it over with some people. And I did. And everybody said, look, you got to do this. You got to take this through. So three days later, he calls back and I said, okay, I'm in. So the road manager called and sent me a ticket and, and uh, joined the band and spent eight months with Woody. Left that band and came back to Dallas and, uh, oh, we started, and actually Houghton and, and Pat Coral had left the band about the same time and the great saxophonist Pete Brewer. And they, they were back in Dallas as well. So we started a band together because we all knew each other. And, and we were on the cutting edge of fusion music then. Uh, so this would have been 1976 through eight or nine. And the group was called High Rise and it was a very unique group. We had a pedal steel guitar player, great percussionist Ron Snyder and those four guys. And, and so we started getting some notoriety and getting record deal offers. We never could agree on the contract stuff, so we didn't sign. But in 79, I auditioned uh, for the Crusaders, Joe Sample, Milton Felder, Six Super. I got that gig, lo and behold. They said, come on out, we'd like you to audition. So I figure it's just me, right? <clears throat> so I fly out with all my gear, my acoustic bass, my electric bass, my amp, everything. Rent a car, go down there. I pull up to their, their building and there's 200 bass players wrapped around this building outside in line. You know, I just thought it was going to be me. I mean, they didn't give me that any, you know, any kind of indication that was going to happen. So I went up to the front then and I said, you know, I'm here uh, to audition. I thought I kind of had a unique audition. And said, no, just get in the back of the line and we'll get to you. Well, a few hours later, you know, uh, it's my turn. I go in and play first tune. Joe Sample says, you know any of our music? And I said, I know all of your music. And uh, being cocky back then, you know, and, well, maybe still. But anyway, I said, I know all your music. And he goes, well, we'll get to that in a minute. He says, do you happen to know I can't, I can't get started? And played that every night with Don Jacoby. You know, and that's where I learned it. And I said, yeah, absolutely. And he says, well, let's play that. And he said, I want to hear you play acoustic bass. He said, we've never had an acoustic bass, but I want to hear you play acoustic bass. So we played I Can't Get Started for my audition. And then we played one of their tunes. And then I got the call about two days later that I had to get. So I moved to LA and um, kind of keep my sanity uh, and my foot in the jazz world, a little more straight ahead jazz world. I started playing in Les Hooper's big band down at the Union Hall once a week just to keep my reading together, keep my, my acoustic chops up because I never ever touched it again with Crusaders other than the audition. Um, spent eight months with them. It was, it was a, a fun time. It was a world tour. And, and so I got to see a lot of the world. And I was also playing in Les Hooper's band and Toshiko's band and uh, Louis Belson's band. So three times a week I was diving into big band down to Union Hall because we could rehearse down there for free. So I was reading some great charts and playing with some wonderful musicians. That's where I met Bob Shue. That's where I met people like John Thomas, uh, Danny Higgins. I mean, the bands were just amazing. And I just decided I didn't like LA. It wasn't for me. And so I moved back to Texas. And it was about two months later, I get a call from Andy Williams to join his band. So I spent three years on the road with Andy Williams, and I got to say, that's one of the nicest gentlemen I've ever known, an amazing musician, and never, ever heard him sing badly that entire time. And we'd do 28 days in a row at Christmas time, and he had more energy than all of us. <clears throat> and um, my son was born in 82, and I just, I told Andy that I wanted to get off the road for a while spend some time with, with my young son. So he said, well, as long as you, you stay on until 
I get to meet yourself. I said, okay. So we had a big in Fort Worth. We were living in Dallas then. <clears throat> and we drove over to the gig and we took the baby with us. And Andy carried Patrick around for two hours. He never once set a foot on stage for the rehearsal. You know, didn't bother with sound check. We said, you know, the road manager says, Andy, you want to come and do your sound check? So we've got a 40 piece orchestra up here. You know, it's going to sound different. And he says, no, I'm right where I need to be. He was carrying Patrick around for a couple hours. Uh, we were with Billy Bob's Texas, one of the biggest bars in the world, and not clubs and restaurant. And, uh, and I left the, the band about a week later <clears throat> and uh, stayed off the road for about two years, three years, and then started back into it heavy. In 86, my wife at the time, Cynthia, and I moved to Colorado for quality of life. <clears throat> so, so I'm always kind of somehow falling into the weeds, you know, and come out on, on top of it all and smell like a rose maybe. But... Uh, I, I was thinking, what am I going to do in Denver? I mean, how am I going to work? You know, I want to stay on the road a lot. Well, I get a call. The last day our house was up for sale in Dallas. I get a call from Charlie Bird's office, and they want me to go on a three-week tour. I said, well, I'm moving to Denver in about a month. I mean, it's really kind of not a good time. They said, well, the first week is in Denver at the Fairmont Hotel. I said, well, let's see you. And then where's the second week? It says New Orleans. And I said, where's the third week? It says in Dallas, where I was living. So I said, well, let me talk over with my wife and I'll get back to you. So again, I've always been a, a processor, so I have to think things through. And so I started looking at that schedule. I said, we can go say in the Fairmont Hotel, look for a place to live. Then I go to New Orleans, make a little money, and then, and then we can come back to Dallas, move out of the house, and we can live in the Fairmont Hotel and then drive to Denver. So it worked out. Timing was amazing. And it worked out. And so we did that. And while I was at the Fairmont uh, in Denver, the bass player became ill. And so uh, Dick Hammergren was the, the band leader's name, met a great trumpet player. And he said, would you mind playing the dance sets with us between your shows? I said, well, you'll have to ask Charlie because, you know, I'm here with Charlie. So they called Charlie up and he said, if, if Lou wants to do it, he can do it. And so it meant I'd have to change out of my suit and tie into a tux three times a night. But I wound up playing all the dance sets with the house band. And they offered me the job. The bass player was leaving going back east to school. In, in three weeks. So I moved to Denver with a full-time job at the Fairmont House Band. So like I say, uh, I've, I've always thought I had a guardian angel. My sister passed away very young in an accident. And uh, she's always been my guardian angel. You know, she looks out after me and helps me get through things that sometimes I tangle myself up in. Uh, so it's just funny how that works out. And then, then I started working with all the people that were coming through the house band. They started asking me out on the road. So I was on the road with Lady Kazan. I was on the road with Emily Harris. I was on the road with uh, the Drifters, the Platters. And I mean, extensive touring with all these folks. So in 88, a, a gentleman you know real well, uh, my good friend Shelly Bird, called me up and said, you know, you published my music. I'd really like to get to know you a little better. Uh, I've got a festival coming up. I'd like to hire you to come in. So I said, okay. And I said, I said uh, what do you want me to do? He says, well, you perform and, and, you know, clinic the bands and work with some students. I said, okay. So I fly to Houston and he, he picks me up at the airport and we're hitting it off good and he says, uh, I'm, um, I should tell you that we have another guest artist. And I said, well, who's that? And he says, Bill Watrous. And my jaw dropped, you know. And you being a trombone, you know. <laughs> he, he, uh, he said, uh, Bill's kind of rough around the edges, but you'll love his playing. So we get to the school, and Bill's, and I can hear Bill inside one of the classrooms warming up. And we're literally walking in, and we're going to have to play about a half an hour. And... And he says, uh, let me introduce you to Bill. He opens the door, 
Bill never stops playing. And he turns around and looks at me and says, Bill, I want you to meet your bass player today. And he just kept playing and he turned away. Didn't want anything to do with it, right? So we get on stage and we all play. And we all, we all became best friends after that. Before it was Tom Cummings, who's our drummer. Later, Randy Drake and that quartet. And, and Shelly and I spent off and on 20 to 22 years with Bill. And I didn't do a lot of road work. And went to Europe, uh, toured all over the U.S. You know, and just, man, there's nothing like standing two feet from the greatest trombone player in the world and watch his effortless mastery. There was never a muscle twitch anywhere. You know, so just amazing. Uh, another person I, I spent a lot of time on the road with was Rich Madison. And he had a lot to do with me going back to school in 89. Um, he said, he was just a, starting that UNF program at the time. Um, I guess I was in a endowed position with Coker in the, uh, Foundation or whatever. And he said, man, if you get your degree, I'll hire you. And I said, well, I've done pretty well without that degree. I really don't know if I can take the time off and the pay cut to go back to school. And he goes, you get a degree, you'll see what I mean. Just do it. I'll hire you. Well, so I go back to school. Well, unfortunately, during that time, Rich passed away. But I toured all over the world with Tuba Jazz and his uh, quintet. We did a, a great record, one of my favorite records with with him was with Louis Belson on drums, Shelly, myself, uh, John Allred and Rich playing euphoniums, and Jack Peterson, the great Jack Peterson on guitar. So I finished the degrees anyway, and I always kind of felt like I owed them to my sister and my family to do that. And, uh, and I kind of felt like I owed it to Rich too, because he encouraged me to do it. So Next thing led to the next thing, and I found out myself finishing a doctorate up too. So it, it was a great ride with all these people on the road. And I mean, the list is really long, you know, it's just too many to even think about. But I've been very fortunate to have a, a, a wonderful, wonderful life in this industry, not only performing, but as an educator too. 26 years at Capitol, uh, those three years at DU, uh, two years at Ball State. So, you know, it was, a, it was a long ride. And that was really about a seventh career. Well, Lou, let, let's stop for just a second and, and reflect back on this incredible career that you've had as a performer. And then to take this job at Capitol and you have built one of the finest jazz programs in the world today. Talk to us about how that came about and how, how uh, some of the highlights of your career there. Okay, first I'd have to say, I had a lot of help building that program. Uh, one never does those types of things alone, as you, as you well know, uh, from building some pretty substantial jazz programs yourself at different universities. Uh, we had a great faculty there. Um, when, I, when I auditioned for the job, I was also offered two other jobs, one at, uh, UCF in Orlando, and one at uh, University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. And both of those are big, big schools, but Capital University really stuck out when I interviewed the all three, you know, back to back in two week period. And uh, Capital University had a vision and the entire faculty shared that vision. And that was to, they had a, a very, strong statement about preparing students to survive in the next century at the time. So we're talking 1994. And that really spoke to me, you know, because I'm a survivor and I had really survived well in this industry. And I wanted to give that back and help some folks with that understanding, what it really does take to make a living you can't just be a player. You have to be a so-called jack of all trades, right? Uh, and I had so many different things in my background. I just felt like I could offer a lot. And so I took the job. Um, I think we had 175 in the conservatory at the time. When I left this year, um, 
we were up to close to 400 student body in the conservatory alone, much larger school than the uh, music school over at OSU, the big school in town, right? Um, but I think we had four ensembles when I joined the faculty. By the, by the time I left, we were up to 12. And they were different types of ensembles. And I always loved that about Capital Two, was they understood that there was viability in all types of music. And the classical folks didn't, didn't fight as much about jazz coming into the system. You know, in fact, they endorsed it, which was really great. I remember uh, the year we created our own second year theory sequence, uh, jazz and, um, what, what do we call it? American jazz and pop music or something like that. It's all escaping me now, Nick, since I retired. But I used Schellenberg's book, Jazz Improvisation, The Golden Method, that's my text, because I was the original publisher on that. And um, I remember when he sent me that book, I couldn't put it down. It was just so well written and really what we do. So I just said, we need more than one semester for this program. This, you know, we're, we're, we're offering a jazz studies degree. We need to let them live in the music a little. Um, they were getting one semester of arranging, one semester of, of uh, theory, you know, in, in, in our field. So we stretched that two, year, two years of, of arranging comp and, and uh, one year of theory. But I remember when we took it to the faculty for the vote, the orchestra director, who had been there 50 years at the time, looked at me and he said, now, Lou, there's certain six chords in music, German, Italian, French, Neapolitan. How will you address that? He thought it was going to hang me up. So. And, you know, my master's degree is in composition and my, my doctorate degree is in, uh, in, in bass performance, but it's actually a secondary in theory of comp. So I had this one back and I was so glad he asked it. And, and I said, well, his name was Nick Perini. I said, Nick, I said, they're all tritone subs or two with exception of the Neapolitan six chord, which is a tritone sub for five. And it's the only difference is the voices. So everything's cyclical in my mind. And it's just a matter of explaining that to people. He goes, I've always said music was cyclical, that everything was two, five, one. He says, you have my vote. And when he did that, the entire faculty voted yes, you know, because he, he was our leader and so well respected and such a, a great musician himself. And I remember the first time I went to his uh, recital, he was a, a horn player, horn and F. I used to call it French horn until he corrected me. He said, no, it's horn and F. <laughs> he played Stardust. He played Stella by Starlight. He played all the great American songbook tunes. On, on horn and F with a pianist you know, and, and, and improvised on it. I was just knocked out by this guy. Mm -hmm. So the fact that he bought into our program really helped us. You know. mm -hmm. So we, we really changed that degree drastically while I was there. And again, it's not just me. I mean, I have some great uh, you know, colleagues in my area. And, and in such a small school, we had at one point, we had seven full-time instructors that were in our area, American pop music and jazz studies and music industry. Because Capital also had uh, a degree in music, merchandising and music uh, technology. And we've eventually separated that technology degree away from the jazz studies program and the uh, pop program, you know, and, and actually just changed it all up, you know, and, and, and rooted in, in what, music is happening today instead of you know things that are, are really old but always paying homage to the folks that came before us as far back as Bach I mean if you ask me the greatest bass player in the world was Bach and if he played B3 it would have been killer <laughs> his bass lines just make so much sense well you know Lou this is this is what schools are working toward today and you were one of the first to recognize that as Shelley is doing now 
at the University of Miami. Similarly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, capital program, congratulations, man. It, it's well, just incredible. Now, we, we want to be sure to get in uh, comments and stories about you as a co-founder of GEN, the Jazz Education Network. Uh, you've filled a plethora of roles in that. Talk to us about GEN and why educators should be a part of this exceptional organization. Well, all three words in our title, Jazz Education and Network. The Jazz Education Network, all three of those words are equally important to those of us that were involved in that steering committee, which you were there. I, I remember that well. We met in Rosemont, Illinois at a small Great Western. Yeah. 37 people in a room that held 30 mm -hmm. uh, for two days solid, if you recall. And we appreciated you being part of that and a lot of uh, people that we loved and respected. And we looked up to us. I, I remember my co-founder, Mary Jo, and I talked about doing this, uh, replacing that organization we all loved and went down after 40 years. And she said, you really think we, we can do this? I said, Mary Jo, we know so many people. It's just about the network. It's about the music and it's about education. And it's kind of the root of, of the title. And, and if you may recall that steering committee actually pulled that title together after about two hours of wordsmithing. And I said, see, I told you. <laughs> but I will say my wife actually gave me the title. <laughs> and she gave us her blessing, too, to spend all that time on this thing, too. Uh, so she's the one we refer to as our godfather of Jen. That's my wife, Mary. Mm -hmm. And a uh, godmother, excuse me, I said that one. Um, but she's been behind us all the way. She works registration with us. But those first couple of years, you know, it was Mary Jo and I doing mostly everything. We had our volunteer board, which volunteered in principle but didn't do much. And we had uh, an executive committee that met once, I believe. Um, and then the second year, we had the first election for a board. And this is now entering, believe it or not, our 13th year. Because those meetings were May 30th and June 1st of 2008. Uh, and those two days, we went in there with an idea, and we came out with not only a name, but a set of really strong bylaws that was very long and would ensure that the organization would move forward and maybe not go bankrupt because um, we put in some built-in watch, watch clauses, if you will. And we also came up with a mission statement, and that's always the hardest thing. And, and the organization has never really steered from that mission. Equally strong, the music, the education part of it, and the network, which is why it's so valuable to be a member of it because where else in this world are you going to be able to walk down the hall and rub elbows with Herbie Hancock, John Clayton, all these people as musicians we all look up to. John Clayton's one of my idols as a bassist, you know. And then turn around and learn from each other from some of the greatest educators in the world that do have a vision and that have been parts you know, a huge part of everything that shaped our world. And it's the place to network with them. I, I, I've had so many of my students over the years volunteer at Jim in pretty hefty capacities. And I always tell them, if I take you to the, to the uh, conference, you're going to work. Because you've got to understand that's what we do. We work for each other. We work with each other. And I'll never forget, I had four kids that were in production and they came running in, into my um, coordinator office. And they said, Dr. Fisher, Dr. Fisher, you'll never guess who we saw in the elevator. I said, who'd you see? Well, we were on the elevator and Herbie Hancock got in the elevator with us. <laughs> and I said, great, so you had a nice conversation, right? Oh no, we didn't say a word. <laughs> and he, he spoke to him. I said, well, what did he say to you? He said, well, we rode up about nine floors, doors open, he got off and he turned around and says, 
nice talking to you. <laughs> I said, what lesson did you learn there, you know? <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it, it is such a hang and such a labor of love from everyone. We're perceived as being much larger than we are. We're, we've got a, a membership pushing 4,000 now, which is really great. And I'm so proud of that. And we're in plus 30 countries now. This year's conference will be totally virtual, given the situation in the world. But I can tell you it's going to be one of the best that we've ever produced. It's going to be one of the most diverse, stylistically, ethnically, gender-wise, you name it. There's, it's on this bill. Uh, and we've got, I mean, just peruse the schedule online at jazzednet.org. Sorry, shameless plug. But um, it's an amazing, it's going to be an amazing event. And I'm just so thrilled we were able to pivot and pull this off virtually. Because that, you know, it's been a tough year for all of us. We all know that. And we had to go with a plan A, B, and C, and now I think we're on plan D. And so we did a lot of work that we don't really use, but we certainly have built a, a mechanism to give us lemonade out of some lemons. Well, we're all looking forward to it, Luke. It's just going to be incredible. And We'll, we'll put on the uh, closing credits how to, how to contact the organization okay. and also the dates of the conference and so forth. And, you know, I join with you in encouraging everybody that's involved with jazz at any level to become a part of Jim. It's a place to be today. It sure is. And, and you know, I'd like to mention something. There is, um, there's always some assistance available, too. I mean, you know yourself, we get... Uh, ample scholarships every year. We we have a young composer showcase. We have, or well, we recognize great composers of several age groups. We have the Sisters of Jazz revitalized. Um, we have generally in a normal year we'd have five stages, uh, about seventy concerts running concurrently, in four days, um, eight clinic rooms, a research area. Where not only do we have posters on site, we have presentations, and now we have a journal that's published through IU. Um, we have amazing partners in the industry. Uh, our Jazz to You re-grant program is funded by the Herb Albert Foundation. Uh, you know, we've got our, every major industry manufacturer uh, working with us to present our conference every year. And I would say none of them deserted us this year either, even though we're going virtual. Um, our virtual offerings will be not only about 40 concerts, either pre-recorded or live remotes from wherever they may be that they can do that. Um, we have concerts from New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Israel, Singapore, Hong Kong. We're, we're all over the map this year. Um, we have every style of music you can imagine. Um, the vision is still there that jazz is all encompassing. You know, jazz is life, and we want it to come across that way. Um, our, our small staff of four, two full-time, two part-time, uh, are all working overtime to pull this off. And kudos to them, and kudos to the board for listening to us. And when, when we pitch them to jerk the live aspect because of the danger right now. But, yeah, I'm excited. And, and just come join us. Come join us. Let's grow this thing together some more. Because it's the greatest organization in the world. Amen. Well, this has been an incredible interview, taking us through your career and all of your contacts and your performances and everything. It's, it's just been fabulous, Lou. Thank you. We, we in Thank closing, you. Uh, always want to ask our guests, would you play something for us? I think I could possibly do that. Uh, have, have a couple of bases in back here. Let me pull one up and try to keep this cable out of there. Maybe I'll take this off for a second. Be right back, okay? Okay. Okay, here we go, guys. I need to put on my headphones so I can hear. This is variations of autumn leaves.
Thank you, Lou. That was terrific. Listen, man, you just need to keep being the person you are because you're such an icon and an idol to people. It's been such a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks again and stay safe. Thank you so much, Dick, for everything you've done for jazz and jazz education. And Bob, yourself, thank you guys for, for humbling me today to be here. And, but uh, so delighted to be able to spend some time with you today. Thanks, thanks again for your participation. To our viewers, we appreciate you joining us today and for being a part of Jazz Zone together. We hope you found the presentation of real value. We hope you'll join us for future episodes. In the meantime, please stay safe and please keep making music. Mm -hmm.